At about the same time, at about a year old, you start to have social interests, and now the words that you're, talk, that you're saying and the things that you're seeing when your parents say, give me the glass and pass the glass, well, you might try to echo some of that. Now you might echo it, but that's not because you want it. You're just echoing it when you see it because now you're labeling things. And your parents say, yes, that is a glass, or that is a cup, that's very good. You say cup, the parent says cup, and you say up, and you say, that's very good, that's very close to cup. That starts to happen at about, about a year old. That's called your tact repertoire, T-A-C-T. It means contact the environment. You start to name things in the environment. Or, for example, when you see something and you name it, that's a tact. When you smell something and you name it, pizza, that's a tact. It's an old factory tact. If you touch something and say, oh, this feels like a... Uh, a table. That's a tactile tact. When you hear a bird chirping and you say bird, that's an auditory tact. You have visual tacts. Mo many of your tacts are visual, but your tacts are also auditory. If you heard a motorcycle go by right now, somebody might say, that's a motorcycle. That would be a tact. You would be labeling the sound you hear. Somebody puts sugar on your tongue and you say sweet. That's a gustatory tact. So anytime your senses contact the environment and you give it a name, that's called tacting. That repertoire develops at about a year old because you're echoing the names of things you're hearing people talk. Get the idea, if parents don't talk in front of their children or to their children, get the idea they would never talk because they have nothing to echo. They have no object to put with a name that you can now echo. That's what starts to occur. It's a behavioral process. And why do you echo it? Because your parents say, oh yeah, that's right, that is a cup. There's lots of social attention very early on for young children to name things. When they go to the zoo and say, there's a giraffe, what happens? Parents say, yes, that is a giraffe, right. Naming things produces a lot of social attention for young children, and that's how they learn the naming, naming basically, skill. At about two, two and a half years old, now you start to respond to what other people say. First you respond to your motivation, then you echo what other people are saying, then you start to label things, and then you start to re respond to what other people say. What did you have for breakfast? Pancakes. What's your favorite food? You now start to respond to other people's verbal behavior. That's called intraverbal behavior. Skinner made up the name as well. It just means responding to intraverbal, intrasocial sort of thing. You respond to what other, other people say. That's your intraverbal uh, repertoire. That's a very important repertoire to develop. Many children with autism fail to develop the intraverbal repertoire. They typically will develop a, somewhat of a man repertoire, a large tact repertoire, and a large listener repertoire, which is understanding or basically receptive language. This could be called receptive language. Touch your nose, go to the door, put on your shoes. This is the other, non, Skinner called it nonverbal. It's just merely responding to what other people say in a motor sort of way. This is responding to what other people say with words. Intraverbal behavior. So your first words are usually man's. You then begin to echo and you develop tacks. By two and a half years old, you have three, four hundred tacks maybe. Maybe a little bit less. At least three hundred tacks or so. You have dozens and dozens of man's. You can echo reasonably well in the language that you have heard. And your intraverbal is now starting to develop for the first time. These are the four repertoires that develop and that you have very, very sophisticated, you have a very sophisticated repertoire in all four of these. This is the way we think they develop through reinforcement, extinction, stimulus control. Words that don't get you things, you don't say. Words that get you things, you say. Words that get punished, you don't say those anymore. Okay? Words that get reinforced, you say. When you're motivated for something, you say something. When social attention is important to you, you say something. You echo as a result of just your development. People come into the world prepared to echo sounds once they get to be about seven, eight, nine months old, the sounds they hear directly. They're prepared to do it. You come into the world prepared to echo. And thank goodness you can. Can you imagine how you would ever teach language if somebody couldn't echo the words you say? In addition, your intraverbal, your tact repertoire begins at about a year old and, and all your labels, hundreds and hundreds of labels. And finally, your intraverbal repertoire develops at about two, two and a half and continues. This is your social repertoire. This is the repertoire when somebody uh, asks you, where is Edinburgh and you say Scotland, okay? It's your intellectual repertoire.
When you meet somebody, it's the introverbal that matters to you. You don't wonder about their man, their tact, or their echoic repertoire. But if you don't have a man, the tact, or echoic repertoire, you're not going to have an introverbal repertoire. And this is the repertoire that children with autism fail to acquire. If you fail to acquire this, you get the idea how you're going to be socially isolated. That's what pa uh, parents kind of care about. What happened at school yesterday? What'd you do? Who'd you play with when, when they come home? That's, your, that's all your introverbal repertoire. Because the person's not there, you can't tack them. They're not going to man for them because they're not motivated for them. And they're certainly not going to echo the name because you don't know the name to give it to them to echo. So they don't know who they played with. Get the idea that introverbal repertoire, it's your storytelling repertoire, it's your narrative repertoire. That's the one that fails to develop in many children. Those are the repertoires that develop. Now this is not Skinner's theory. These are the natural laws of language development. Nature decided there would be a man, the tact, and a coic, and introverbal. Not Skinner. In the same way that Newton didn't decide that there would be gravity. He just uncovered it and gave it a name. He didn't decide gravity would exist. Gravity existed long before Newton. But he's the one that uncovered the principles and gave it a name so that we could then use it. Man, tacticoic, introverbal, they existed long before B.F. Skinner had any idea was, was alive. For millions and millions of years, those repertoires developed and language developed that way. Skinner merely, in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s, uncovered these basic principles that govern the development of language. I think he got it right. What I do know is this. I, I'm certain he got it right, but not everybody agrees. But I'm sure he does. But what I can tell you is true, that if you make use of this analysis of language, you will be more effective with persons who don't learn language typically. There's no question about that. The data are in on that one. That whether you buy it or not, that this is the way it happens. If you, if you treat children with autism that's guided by these different verbal operants, these different verbal classes, understand the basic principles, you'll have a better outcome with the persons you work with who have not acquired language typically. Now, I think typical individuals like everyone in this room or whatever your, your, your status is, learned language, or anyone in this room who has a sophisticated language repertoire is a better way of putting it. Anybody who has, which is the, the entire group, you learned it through these principles. These principles affected all of us. Your parents didn't sit around and say, wow, I wonder, he's two and a half, Vince is two and a half now. I wonder how his intraverbals are coming along. My parents couldn't spell intraverbal, no less no one, one was, okay? But I developed an intraverbal repertoire. It didn't matter. If, if your nervous system is not affected in any sort of way, that the everyday life experiences are going to arrange the contingencies of reinforcement to produce a good speaker. But now if your nervous system is in some way disrupted, the everyday contingencies of life are not going to be sufficient to produce the kind of outcome we'd like to see. So what do we do? We figure out what the contingencies were. By contingencies, I mean procedures and methods that taught someone, a typical individual, or somebody with a good language repertoire, to develop it. And now let's apply it in an orderly way to persons with autism. That's what we're doing. It's not like it's some different sort of mystical sort of thing. It's applying how everyone has learned in very precise and exact ways to persons whose nervous system don't respond effectively, whose repertoires don't respond effectively to everyday life sort of experiences.